We're going to begin where we're going to end today, and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll be reading verses 12 through 14. The scripture says this, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we, be ba- whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would speak to us very clearly through your word. Father, that you would impress upon us the need to be humble, the need to submit our lives to others, Father, the need to be joined to and committed to the body of Christ. Father, give us an understanding of your word and how it applies to each one of our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we've been looking at the foundations of the Christian faith, we come now to the next step in your walk with the Lord, and that is membership. As we've looked previously, um, the most important thing is that you are born again that you are regenerate, that you believe in Jesus Christ. Upon believing in Jesus Christ, as we looked last week, you need to profess him openly before men through baptism. If you are a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, the next aspect of your walk with the Lord, the next step is to be a member of a local church. Um, As we we look at this, I'm going to speak rather forcibly um, from Scripture on some things, and so I would ask that you be gracious with me and I will try to be gracious with you as well, because every person's circumstances and experiences are different. And it's impossible for me to speak directly to your particular circumstances, so I'm going to be speaking in very general terms from the Word of God, but quite forcibly from from those terms. So I would encourage you to let the Spirit of God speak and to let Him apply it in your particular situation. As we look at membership, you may go, okay, well, I'm already a member, so I'm just going to clock out, okay? Well, there are a lot of people who are members who don't do what we're going to be talking about today, because what we're going to be looking at is not necessarily membership, but we are going to be looking at the heart behind membership, because there's many people who are members of churches who don't have the actual commitment to the body of Christ, and there's some people who are more committed to the body of Christ than actual church members, And what we want to look at today is the commitment aspect to the body of Christ, and we want to really address the why. So we're going to focus more on the why people are so reticent to commit, and then we'll look at membership. If you were to look at the church today in terms of just across the United States, membership is something that is kind of going the way of the dodo bird. It is disappearing very, very quickly. In fact, a lot of churches don't really have much of a membership. And some churches that have a membership, it's not very meaningful at all. Uh, I know of a church that had 1,000 members and 25 people in attendance, okay? Um, Sometimes you'll have members and you don't even know if they're alive or dead. Their name's just on a piece of paper. What we're talking about today is an actual commitment to the body of Christ that is a meaningful commitment, a meaningful membership. If you ask why is church membership declining, well, there's, there's several reasons, but it's, it's kind of two factors. One, you have pastors who are doing away with membership, and there's a, there's a reason behind this. Um, a lot of churches that are planted today do not have church membership, and the reason being is the dreaded Baptist business meeting, okay? Because it's so much easier to not have to run things past all the stubborn people in the church who don't know what they're doing, and if you don't have membership, you can just do it your own way. In fact, many churches um, that have members, if membership, if you look closely, they're not actually meaningful membership. In other words, you still have no say-so whatsoever in the direction of the church. And a lot of your bigger churches, there's, there's members that aren't even part of the church. The pastor's a member, and he has a couple of buddies from seminary that are members of the church, and those are the ones that have the control and power of the church. I, I know of a church that had, um, uh, the, I think they had like close to 100 elders, and the elders weren't even members of the church. Okay, um, th- like 20 pastors, and only one of the pastors was actually a member of the church. And it's because it's easier to have your way, and when you don't have to bounce it off anybody. It's power, control, and you don't have to deal with aggravating people when you don't have membership. Well, it's not just pastors, it's also the opposite, and that is that people, regular church people, 
don't want to commit either. Okay? The same reason, because, well, I can't find a church that does it the way I want it done, or there's not a church that will listen to me, or I, I, I went all in the church and it blew up in my face, I'm never doing that again, or you know what, all the people of that church were so judgmental about me and the way I lived my life. And, and so you have where there's a lot of people that don't want to join a church, don't want to commit a church, and you'll have people that will attend a church for 20, 30, 40 years and never join. But this is also just part of our society. We live in a society that has no commitment. Okay? We have rampant divorce, which means you're not committed to your spouse. You have fatherless homes, which means you're not committed to your own children. You have couples that live together because they won't commit. And you look at this and you go, okay, if someone is not going to commit to their spouse and they're not going to commit to their own children, why would we expect them to commit to a local church? So this question then comes is why don't people commit to anything? Well, the answer, is, as Anthony shared, is really an issue of pride. And so I want to kind of follow a sequence of, of thoughts as we, we begin to delve into Scripture. Okay, what is pride? What is arrogance? Well, it's just a, a higher view of self than is real. It's, a, it's an overinflated view of self. It's an overvaluation of self. And if you, if you pay attention to that idea of thinking higher of yourself than you should, intrinsic within arrogance by definition, is ignorance. The reason I think I'm so great is literally because I do not know the facts concerning myself. So, for, for example, if you took a, a freshman in high school and he wanted to try out for the football team and he, be, he believed that he was the greatest quarterback that ever lived, we all know if you believe as a freshman in high school you're the greatest quarterback that ever lived, you are very ignorant, you must not know about the NFL or Division I college football. You must not have a clue about Joe Montana and Tom Brady and Troy Aikman and Brett Favre and all those guys. You must have no clue about it. You have to be ignorant to be that arrogant. But you know what happens when you are ignorant and arrogant? You know what you realize? Just like that high school freshman, nobody can speak into my life because they don't know what I know. I don't need a coach. Okay? I don't need anybody to give me any type of advice. My throwing motion's fine. The problem is the wide receivers ran the wrong route. It's not my accuracy, okay? It wasn't that I held the ball too long and, and ran outside the pocket. The problem is I need new linemen. The problem is always someone else because I have life figured out. If you notice, this is one of the big problems in marriage. The problem can't possibly be that I'm a bad spouse. No, I just married the wrong person. They need to be talked to. They need to be instructed. The problem can't be me as a parent. No, I just got defective kids. That, that's the way we view the world. The problem can't be that I have no clue about money. No, the entire system's out to get me. No, it's possible that you are ignorant. But what happens when you are arrogant and ignorant is you will not commit to anyone. You are independent. No one can tell you what to do. And that leads to the way, by the way, to power issues. If you're the only one that knows what's right, then you should be the one that coaches the football team. You may be a freshman in high school, but you should be the one calling the plays. You may not have a clue about foreign policy, but you know more than all of the secretaries of states. You can't even tell me the capital of Iran, but you know all about what we should be doing with Iran and Hezbollah and all that type of stuff. You see, what happens is our ignorance produces this independence, which produces a hunger for power and control. You can see that in the church. Well, I'm not going to join because no church does what I want it to do. Or a pastor. We're not going to have membership because I'm the one who knows better than everybody else. Now, if you look at that and you look at the opposite, what is the opposite of arrogance and pride? It's humility. You know what humility is? It's an accurate view of self. It's not undervaluing self. It's an accurate view of self. You know how you have an accurate view of self? You're not ignorant. You watched the tape and you saw how bad of a quarterback you really are. You looked at the stat line afterwards and you go, wow, I have a 10% completion percentage. I'm not the greatest quarterback that's ever lived. Okay? You look at your finances and you go, I'm broke. Maybe I don't understand money. Okay? That's what happens. Humility it gets, it gets created through knowledge about yourself and about the world around you. And guess what humble people realize? Exactly what Anthony shared this morning. You know what humble people realize? I need help. If I'm going to be a good mom, I need to find someone who's a good mom, and I need to submit to them and listen to them. 
if I want to have financial freedom, you know what I need to find? Somebody who understands money. And you know what? I need to listen to them. Not go, well, they're, they're stupid. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, that's the way to be poor. It is. If you want to have anything in life, you have to find someone who has it, and you have to submit to them. Okay? That's just the way it goes. And you know what happens in submission is you're relinquishing power and control. And you're listening to other people. Now, with, with that in mind, we need to understand that the most deadly form of pride there is, the most deadly arrogance there is, is spiritual pride. Where I believe that I am closer to God than everyone else I know. And that is an overvaluation of self. And because of this, I don't need anyone else to help me in my walk with the Lord. Now, I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 5 with me. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, he's talking about walking in the Spirit. And, and the way you walk in the Spirit and the way that that manifests itself in verse 19 is that you're singing songs to other people to encourage them in their walk with the Lord. In verse 20, you're giving thanks. These are all marks of walking in the Spirit. But verse 21, guess what is a commanded mark of walking in the Spirit? Submission to other believers. That is something that is commanded. Okay, so let me put it to you another way. If you are not living in submission to other believers, you are living in direct rebellion against God. It's sin. Okay, well, why would you be commanded to submit to other believers? Because hopefully you have the humility to realize you're not all that in the loaf of bread. Hopefully you have the humility to realize you need help. Hopefully you have the humility to realize that you're not the smartest person in the room. You're not the closest person to Jesus. And by the way, if you are the closest person to Jesus you know, you need to make new friends. I mean, that's just the reality. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Okay? Either that or you're completely blinded by pride. You need other people that have the permission to speak into your life and your walk with the Lord. And you need to listen to them. You need to find people who are further ahead of you in their walk with Jesus Christ, and you need to come behind them and listen to them. You need to submit to them. So what does this mean? For me, this is becoming a very important thing to me. Um, as a pastor, all the time I get criticisms, whether it's just anonymous comments or emails or notes. And, and here's the thing. When somebody comes to me and they have a criticism, I have one real question that I'll find out. I don't ask this directly. I have, I, have, I, have a, I have asked this directly. But this is the question that I really want to get at. Who are you submitted to? And if the answer is nobody, I completely ignore what you have to say. Why? Because if you believe that you are the most spiritual person you know, then you're an arrogant fool. And I don't listen to arrogant fools. You see, I live a life of submission Everything I'm saying here this morning comes from submission to other men and women who are wiser than me, who have helped me understand this. I live a life of submission to the membership of this church. Why? Because I don't have all the answers. And I have had to surround myself with people who are further ahead. If you are not willing to do that, then no one should listen to what you have to say. Okay? If you want to go somewhere in life, you need to be living a life of submission. Okay? The independent Christian life is an oxymoron. You can't find it in Scripture. Lone Ranger Christianity is absent from Scripture. And anybody that you think is a Lone Ranger Christian, you'll find out if you actually study the Bible, they're not. They're living a life of submission to God and to other believers. Now, you may say, well, I just can't find a church that understands Scripture correctly. Well, do you understand Scripture correctly? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Surely you've read this. Knowing this, first of all, you know what first of all means? This is something you should learn in like elementary Christianity. The most basic principle of understanding Scripture is what? 
that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. That if you interpret Scripture alone without submitting it to any other believer, your interpretation of Scripture is suspect and should not be trusted. That's what Scripture says. Scripture is to be interpreted within the context of Spirit-filled believers. That is the church. Okay? Notice when we say the church, we're, not talk, we're talking about church authority in just a little bit. We're not talking about a pope. We're not talking about a council of bishops. We're talking about where two or three are gathered together in his name. We are talking about the body of Christ. We have the individual priesthood of the believer. Okay? Here's the truth. You can interpret Scripture, I know this is a shock, and get it wrong. The Pharisees were Bible thumpers who knew the Bible far better than anyone in this room, and they missed it. What makes you think that you're better than them except foolish pride? No, if you read something in Scripture and you come to an interpretation of Scripture, you know what you need to do with that Scripture? You need to submit it to other Spirit-filled believers to verify that your understanding of Scripture is correct. I want to kind of skim through a couple of passages of Scripture here to look at the Apostle Paul. Okay? I, I don't think any of us could argue that the Apostle Paul had some of the greatest wisdom from God in direct revelation. His salvation came from seeing Jesus on the road to Damascus. Okay? He saw Jesus. He heard Jesus audibly. In Galatians chapter 1, he talks about his experience. Okay? When he who set me apart before I was born called me by his grace, notice in verse 16, was pleased to reveal his son to me. Paul had divine revelation. He heard audibly the voice of Jesus Christ. He talked with Jesus Christ personally after his resurrection. Okay? And verse 17, he didn't go and consult other people. But you know what he did? In verse 18, he went and spent three years in the desert of Arabia. Okay? Three years alone, reading the Bible. Three years by himself getting divine revelation that you can read about throughout all of Scripture. Now, when we look at this and we go, well, well, this seems the opposite. Paul's all by himself, spending three years alone with the Bible. No, 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 let, let's just stop for a minute. Paul is demonstrating humility here. This is a man who has studied the Bible his entire life, thought he was living for God, and realized that everything he thought that he was doing for God was actually against God. And you know what people do when they realize they make that big of a mistake? They humble themselves, they shut up, and they don't say a word until they've actually figured it out. And so for three years, he doesn't teach, he doesn't stand in the pulpit, he doesn't instruct. For three years, he keeps his mouth shut and listens to God because he realized his entire life, he missed the boat. His entire life, he was wrong. You know what arrogant people do? When they find out they're wrong, the first thing they do is, i got to run and tell everybody now that I figured out the truth. No. You need to be quiet for a little bit. You need to back off for a while. You need to have the humility to realize that you were blinded. Okay? And you need to take some time. Well, then, what does Paul do? Well, Paul is writing to the Galatian church, and he's showing his authority in interpreting Scripture. Where does authority come from? Well, verse 18 he went to Peter the Apostle and submitted his divine revelation from God himself. And then in verse 19, he went to James, Jesus' brother. The Apostle Paul submitted the gospel he preached to others. Even though he had divine revelation and audibly spoke face to face with Jesus after his resurrection. Okay, you and I have no excuse to not submit to other people. The Apostle Paul did. So much so, Acts 15. After all of this, after these three years of studying with divine revelation, after this submission to Peter, submission to James, Paul runs with Barnabas into a conflict over circumcision. And so, verse 2, instead of standing and saying, I spent three years in the desert alone with God, talking to Jesus face to face, where's your divine revelation? You know what he says? Okay, let's go back and submit to the church in Jerusalem. You know what he does? He goes back to the apostles and elders, and as we're going to see, not just the apostles and elders, he goes back and lives a life of submission to the gathered church. He goes in verse 2 to Jerusalem, the apostles and elders. In verse 4, 
they are welcomed by the church along with the apostles and elders. Okay, this is important because we so often when we begin to look at this, and this is, by the way, by the way why we are a congregational church, because we believe that God has vested within the congregation authority. He has not created an ecclesiastical body. As we're going to see, the apostles and elders themselves, in answer to this question, submit to the local church. They have this discussion over circumcision. And notice the letter that they write at the end. Okay, Verse 23, the brothers. Who writes the letter to all the churches? The church in Jerusalem. In the church includes the apostles and elders, yes. But what is this showing us? That it was not the apostles that came out of their closed-door meeting and told the entire congregation at Jerusalem, oh, by the way, this is from God, this is what we're doing. No, they submitted it to the congregation, and the church approved and saw what they were saying in Scripture. Now, if the apostle Paul... And all the rest of the apostles will submit to the local church. How arrogant do you have to be to not live a life of submission to the local church? The apostle Paul himself submitted. Now, I want you to notice as we look in this, I want to look at a Bible verse that most of us don't really like because it throws a monkey wrench in our theology. And by the way, if the Bible throws a monkey wrench in your theology, maybe your theology is wrong. Okay, just throwing that out there. John chapter 20, verse 22. Okay? And Jesus, after Jesus' resurrection, when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. I thought the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. Eh? You ever read John 20? Okay, that's a whole other, we can chase that rabbit another day. What I want to focus though on is verse 23. He is now speaking to spirit and dwelt believers. And this is what Jesus says. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What on earth is he saying? It sure sounds like that Jesus is giving his disciples an authority over who's in the kingdom and who's not. Well, what about Matthew 18, verse 17, talking about someone who falls into sin? Notice what he says? If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. It doesn't say tell it to the elders. It doesn't say tell it to the council of bishops. It doesn't say to the council of the cardinals. It doesn't say tell it to, to, to some, some gathered ecclesiastical body. It's to go to the church. Why does it go to the church? Because, notice what he says, if he neglects to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That is someone who is not a believer. Verse 18, I'm going to tell you the truth. Here's the principle that Jesus is getting at. Whatever you, that is the church, binds on earth, that is receives into its membership, binds into the body of Christ, you know what he says? Will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, that is, it says, you're a Gentile, you're a tax collector, you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. You know what he says? We'll be loosed in heaven. Jesus Christ has delegated to the local church the authority to receive into membership and to reject from membership. He has not given it to elders. He's not given it to pastors. He's given it to the local church. By the way, when someone joins our church, they have to give their testimony publicly. You know why? Because of this verse. I don't have the authority to stand up and say, this person's now a member of our church because I say so. I don't have that authority. I have to submit to the local congregation. Okay? Why has he done this? You look at this and you go, well, are you saying that, that, that my relationship between me and God is not just between me and God? Yes, I'm saying that because Jesus said that. You see, what you need, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you are isolated and alone, you will begin to have doubts about your standing before God and you need brothers and sisters that come alongside you and say, brother, I see the grace of God in your life and you have no reason to doubt. I have this conversation all the time as a pastor, even this past week. Okay, Someone who loves the Lord, 
said, I, I'm just struggling. Sometimes I wonder if I'm even saved. You know what your job is as a Christian? Is to bind them and say, oh, sister, oh, brother, I see God's grace in your life. And I know that you can't see it and all you see is your failures, but I see what He has done in your life. Don't despair. By the same token, there are many wolves in sheep's clothing who are arrogant, who show no evidence of God's grace, who they believe that the entire church must bow down to their wishes because they say so. And you know what the entire church needs to say? That is not the spirit of Christ. That is the spirit of Antichrist. And if the entire church says that, and you are not humbled enough to listen to all of the people who know you, you should be terrified for the state of your soul. You should be absolutely terrified if brothers and sisters don't see God's grace in your life. Notice this authority is given to the congregation. It's not given to an ecclesiastical body. I can't be a pope and say, well, you know what, you're a Christian. You're not. I don't have that authority. This is important, by the way. Very, very important. This, this solves, by the way, a lot of the conflict that you'll have throughout Christianity. Um, recently, a couple years ago, um, a guy that was running for president of the Southern Baptist Convention lost the election, and he blamed another pastor. So he sued him. Okay, Now, this will show you just how much godliness is there. He sued him for the lost honorariums he would have received when churches would have invited to come and preach and paid him lots of money because he was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Just screams holiness, doesn't it? Okay. Well, this pre preacher had preached previously on 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tell us? That Christians aren't supposed to sue other Christians. And so he got called out on it for being a hypocrite. And the response from his camp and his crowd was, well, this other brother isn't our brother in Christ. This other pastor is not a believer. You don't have the authority to make that judgment. You don't. Unless his local church filled with people who have known him, had him in their homes, been in their homes, examined his fruit, and seen him, if they say, we see no evidence of his faith in Christ, okay, then you may have something there. But you don't have the authority to look at some random guy on TV and go, he's not my brother in Christ. You don't know him. That's arrogance. You're imposing an authority that belongs to Jesus Christ that he has delegated to the local church, not to you. You don't have the authority to look at a brother in Christ who has been welcomed and received by the local church and say, I'm not going to treat you like my brother in Christ because I don't think you are. You don't have that authority. That is arrogance. You are to live a life of submission, a life of humility. Now, when we look at this, you go, well, well I, don't, I don't see membership here, but, but you can see it through all of this. How do you know who's in the church and who's outside the church? Well, the church determines who's in the church and who's outside the church. We don't let just random people come to our church and tell us what to do. Why? Because I guarantee you Satan would love to tell our church what our theology should be. Well, it's our, our members that get to determine our theology. It's our members that wrestle with Scripture together. Okay. Well, how do we know who's in and who's out? Well, if you look throughout Scripture, you can see this precedent of knowing who's a believer. Notice in Matthew 18. Okay? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? Okay? If you are a shepherd, you know how many sheep you have. As a parent, you know how many kids you have. If you're a chaperone on a trip to Disney World, you know how many kids are in your car and you count noses the entire time you're at Disney World until you get back in the car and you count noses every rest stop. Why? Because you don't leave a kid behind. Okay? As a church, we need to know who the sheep are and who we're responsible to God for. Notice in Hebrews 17, 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. You should submit to the elders of the church. Why? For they are keeping watch over your souls. Another title or word for pastor or elder is overseer. What do they oversee? Your soul. They care about you. They desire to see you walk with the Lord. Okay? Those, as those who must give an account. I answer to God for every sheep that he has entrusted to my care. Okay, let me just to give you an, a, a, an illustration of this. 
let's say that I'm going to take a group of kids from the church to Disney World. And so I just say, whoever wants to go, hop in the car. I never look back. I never count how many kids are in the car. I go to Disney World. I never count how many get out of the car. I go around the theme park. I meet some kids that I know elsewhere. I meet some other friends, and, and we, we hang out and all this type of stuff. And then I go, it's time for me to go home. And I go get back in my car, and I don't count to see who else is in the car. And I come back. Am I being a responsible individual? No. What would you do if I left your kid at Disney World? I answer to God for his sheep. That is a solemn responsibility. I have to give an account to God for every single member of the church. I've had people come to me, well, church membership's not biblical. And I ask them, okay, explain to me what I answer to God for them. How many weeks does someone have to attend the church before I answer to God? Once? What if there is a, a Christian, okay, in Miami? Do I answer to God for their soul? No, there has to be a definitive number of people. That I don't get to make that choice. That is what the church determines, okay, Matthew 18, by receiving into its membership that I answer to God for. Okay, this is why when I first became pastor here, I did the same thing my dad did when he became a pastor, and that is we are getting our membership straightened out. You know why? Because I answer to God for every single member of this church. And I'm not going to leave sheep. I'm going to find them. And so we personally contacted every person who's member, who is a member on this church. Why? Because I answered to God for them. But let me tell you something about Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is not directed to pastors. Matthew 18 is directed to Christians. You are responsible for the members of this church because you are covenanted together and part of the body with them. You're responsible. The same way you're responsible for your hands and your feet, you're responsible for the other members of the church. You have to keep track of them. You have to watch out for their souls. That's what it means to be a member. It's not just to come and give me permission to be your pastor. No, you join the church. And if I die, the church still exists. If I die, the membership still exists and should still care for one another. Okay? That's the part and responsibility that we play, that we are responsible before God for each other, and we watch out for each other, and we make sure we don't lose any sheep. We make sure that no sheep go astray. We watch out and we help one another. Notice this throughout Acts, Acts chapter 1. Notice there were 120. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, there were about 3,000. Acts chapter 4, verse 4, there were about 5,000. The early church knew and published and made it clear how many members they had. You go, well, it said about so many. Notice Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. Now the full number. In other words, even though the church was over 5,000 people at this point in time, they were still able to keep track of who was actually involved in the life of the church. And they were able to give an account for the entire number of their membership. Some people will say things like, well, mega churches aren't biblical. The very first church was a mega church. The issue is that we have adopted a model of membership where you have one man that's responsible for everyone and we're not responsible for anybody. No, we're all responsible for one another. And if we each took that responsibility seriously, where I'm going to be watching out for the people in my small group, and I'm going to, they're going to watch out for me, you know what you have? You can have a church that meets in, in Solomon's portico of 5,000 people, but they meet house to house keeping track of every single one of their members. That's exactly what you have in Acts. To keep track and be able to know, this is my brother in Christ. I'm accountable to God for him. This is my sister in Christ. I'm accountable to God for her. We are in this body together. By the way, Acts chapter 9, verse 26, is a very difficult passage of Scripture to explain if you don't believe in church membership. Because when Paul came to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples and they said no. Explain that one if you don't believe in church membership. 
They met in public. What did they do? Have bodyguards in Solomon's temple on the Solomon's porch there and go and stand there and say, I'm sorry, Paul, you can't sing songs with us today even though we're in a public place? No. Paul says, hey, can I come to your house where you all are going to gather together and have close fellowship and share prayer requests and minister to one another and take the Lord's Supper together? And they said, I'm not giving you my address because I think you're a wolf. You see, they were exercising their authority that God has given to the local church. Now, Barnabas comes, and Paul is eventually welcomed into the church at Jerusalem. But you see, you have a responsibility. People can deceive me. And by the way, you know who the number one person they want to deceive in this church is? Me. Why? Because I'm the shepherd. I'm the one that's supposed to protect the sheep. And I'll be honest with you, when we've had wolves come into our church, sometimes I'm the last person to find out. You know why? Because they're willing to bite you. They're not willing to bite me. And what they'll do is they'll bite you and they'll try to make you sound crazy to me so that when you come saying, hey, they bit me. I've had this happen before. These people will come and proverbially, hey, so-and-so bit me. Well, did they really? You know, I've talked with them about this, and, and, and I've made huge mistakes before. Why? Because they're trying to deceive me. That's why the membership is determined by the members, not by the shepherds. Your job is to inspect fruit. Your job is to go pull on the wool and see if it comes off. Okay? Your job is to listen to someone when they give their testimony, to meet with someone when they start visiting the church and see who they are. Have them in your home. See if they're walking with Christ. Why? Because you may be a Barnabas that brings in someone that I would reject and I would be wrong. But you also might protect the congregation by exposing a wolf that has me deceived. This brings us to the passage of Scripture that we began with in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it speaks about how the body, in verse 12, has many members. All the members of that body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Verse 18, as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The Bible teaches in the most overwhelming, strongest of terms, a church membership that is determined by the church members, where they bind into its membership and when they loose from its membership, where we know one another and we submit to one another and we interpret Scripture together in humility so that we might work together as one body to reach the nations, to reach our community. This is a, a nice segue into what we're going to be looking at next week, which is, which is finding your place in the body of Christ to serve. Okay? You need to not just join to have your name on a roll. You need to join so that you can use your gifts to advance the body of Christ, to advance the kingdom of God. I tell people when we talk about joining, it's like, well, you, you don't just need our accountability. We need you to hold us accountable. I need wisdom. As someone who submits to the congregation, you know what I need? I need spiritual men and women in the church who are devoted to the Word of God that can speak wisdom into my life and into our church. I want us to, to really close, and I'm probably going to say it about 12 times in the next minute and a half, but if you're not a member, you need to join Antioch Baptist Church. You do. Now, I understand that you may have been hurt. I understand you may not know us very well. I understand all of that. Those who join quick, leave quick. Take your time. Get to know us. Make sure that we are who we say we are. Get to know not just me. Get to know the people of the church. Do your homework. Okay? One of the things that my, my girls aren't old enough yet, but as they get older, one of the things I'm going to tell them, before you get married and submit to a man, make sure he's worth submitting to. 
before you say, I'm going to submit to the members of this church, make sure we're worth submitting to. That being said, okay, most of you all know I have a kidney disease, and unless the Lord miraculously heals me, um, I'll have to have a kidney transplant in probably about 10 or 15 years. And I had a friend recently texted me, he's like, hey, I'll give you one of my kidneys. It's one of the most touching things anybody's ever done for me. And I was like, wow. But I told him, like, wait on that one. You know why? Because if he cuts out his kidney right now, by the time I need it, that kidney will be dead. When you are severed from the body of Christ, your soul can wither and die quickly. You are prime for Satan's attacks. He is a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And the more comfortable you get not living a life of submission, the more blinded by your own pride you will become, and the more open you will be for Satan to destroy you and your family. You need to be enclosed in the fold every night with the shepherd sleeping across the doorway. Okay? If you understand the sheepfold idea, the sheepfold in the Middle East that Jesus talked about so often, okay, it was a U-shape with about a five-foot opening. And when Jesus says, I am the door, no one comes in the sheepfold but by me, what would happen is the shepherd, every night, he would bring the sheep into that enclosure, and he would count every single one of them as they walked through that opening. And when the last sheep was in, he would lay down and sleep across that opening. There was no getting in or no getting out but through the shepherd. You need to be enclosed in the sheepfold. You need to be counted on a regular basis. I have a spreadsheet on my computer where I keep track of every member of our church when they're in church, when they're not in church. Why? Because I answer to God to make sure every sheep's in the sheepfold. I was talking to a pastor about this recently, and he was talking about, you know, I asked him, what do you do with people that aren't members of your church? He said, well, I'm very friendly, I'm kind, I try to help them as much as I can, but at the end of the day, I tell them, you haven't given me permission to be your pastor. I answer to God for the sheep, not the visitors. You need to join. And if it's not here, praise God. Go find another church and join it. You need to join a church. If you are not an active member, submitted to the body of Christ, surrounded by others who are there to help you and keep track of you, your soul is in danger. You need to join a church. I believe you should join Antioch, but you need to seek the Lord on that. You need to pray. You need to ask questions. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to forget about church membership and you need to run to Jesus. You need to believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you have not professed him openly in baptism, you need to get baptized. But if you're a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, the very next step in your walk with the Lord is you need to join a church. And if you're a member here, don't take that responsibility lightly. You need to remember that you answer to God for your brothers and sisters. May we live a life of submission the same way that Jesus Christ submitted to his Father. Amen.